be from Vancouver, I would gloat about how at home it's super sunny and the flowers are starting to come out and there's buds on the trees, um, but I'm moving to Chicago at 6 o'clock in the morning tomorrow where apparently it's like post-apocalyptic cold, so I can't do my usual like, haha, too, sucks to be Toronto weather because uh, I'm getting a worse tomorrow. Uh, so yes, yeah, you heard my introduction, um, I am moving down to the States to go work for the Gates Foundation. I took this super sweet job um, as director of Deputy Director of Surveillance Data and Epidemiology. It's all about kind of scaling up genetic and genomic surveillance and the use of data to drive global health decision making. Um, so I figured because this is kind of like the end of my academic career talk, instead of giving a data talk and talking about research projects and the things that we found over the last 10 years from sequencing a whole bunch of TB genomes, I do some just big picture lessons learned, like five kind of takeaway messages that um, I've kind of come up with over the last decade of working in a slightly unusual environment, which is the BC Center for Disease Control. It's not like working in a traditional academic space. I do have a UBC affiliation, the School of Population and Public Health, but I spend most of my time at BCCDC doing sequencing. This is BCCDC, lovingly rendered in watercolor. Um, and I started working there 10 years ago, and it was a dream job. I just finished my postdoc, and when I was a teenager, I saw the completely terrible movie Outbreak uh, with Dustin Hoffman. If you are up late at night surfing through cheap cable channels, you'll usually find it on somewhere. Uh, and in it, Dustin Hoffman's the CDC epidemiologist, and he's trying to stop an outbreak of this Ebola-like hemorrhagic fever. He's chasing a monkey around in the jungle with a butterfly net. He's in helicopter chases. And I was like, I want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, turns out the reality of public health is very different from the Hollywood version, but it was still quite, quite rewarding. Um, but that's kind of what drew me to CDC. I'd always wanted to have that disease detective job, and I was recruited there um, right at the beginning of the 2009 H1N1 pandemic um, to basically make genomics a thing at BC CDC. And it was an incredible place to start up a new kind of a research program because you can see here, it is the provincial sort of public health watchdog slash agency. We have it all. That building is filled with samples. Uh, the public health lab receives, I think, upwards of about two million samples a year. So there's an incredible amount of pathogen material coming into the building. And because of the work that we do around surveillance, around epidemiology, there's a ton of data about those samples as well, whether it's individual patient level data, whether it's aggregate incidence rates and counts. It's an amazing place to work both with pathogen material and pathogen data. So I was hired to take pathogen material analysis into kind of a new space. Um, around, I guess about 12 years ago, uh, the center started thinking about genomics. Uh, the executive director at the time, one of the um, medical microbiologists as well, they realized that genome sequencing and the introduction of next generation sequencing tools, um, in fact that sequencing was going to get a lot cheaper, really had the potential to change how public health um, operated. And they were interested in getting out of the leading edge of that. Um, and to make a very long story, decade long story short, um, we were successful ultimately. Um, when I started at CDC in 2009, there were sort of 1.5 of us in the building that were working on genomics projects. And now as I leave, I'd say there's probably about 50 people in the building who on a daily basis are directly engaged with some sort of genomic analysis. And we've gone from just doing it on a handful of pathogens, tuberculosis, influenza, to really a whole suite of bugs. So the first lesson that I want to give you, I'll hit you, uh, hit you with one early, and that kind of goes back to CDC being prescient about genomics. And it's the interesting thing, kind of getting ahead and being at the leading edge, really happens when you commit as an organization, whether it's a lab, whether it's an entity um, like the hospital or like sick kids, or an entity like BC 
CDC when you commit to innovation. And you kind of always have to have your ear to the ground and be, be listening for what the next big thing is. And it's not just enough to be listening and sensing, like, what do I think is cool? What's the new hot trending thing? But it's also investing it investing in it, supporting it, and being uh, willing to take risks around it too. So genomics was something that uh, 10 years ago, we had no idea, we had an inkling that it might sort of change public health, but we had no idea. But the executive director, Genome British Columbia, a group of researchers were willing to take the risk to throw a bunch of money at a very cool project that might have yielded nothing or it might have yielded everything. They were willing to take that risk. And <clears throat> it worked. Um, we, with that one analysis, I can tell you a bit more about it later, but we basically kind of invented a new way of doing public health, this idea of genomic epidemiology. And so the risk paid off in that case. It won't always pay off, um, but you have to be willing to take chances and try the next big thing. Public health agencies are incredibly rewarding places to work because the informatics and the sequencing that you're doing is in real time being applied to public health problems. And you can see uh, your work making a difference. But at the same time, they're also really frustrating places to work, which is maybe one of the reasons why I'm leaving. Um, they're, they're very slow to change. Um, they're very innovation averse. We were lucky in that we had an executive director at the time who supported change and innovation and risk taking, but that's not always the way, and it's not always the case with every agency. But I think we as bioinformaticians are uniquely positioned to kind of help be change agents in these sort of slow um, molasses-like bureaucracies that you occasionally encounter in healthcare. Um, I often think that public health and um, hospitals and healthcare in general would work a little bit better if it, they behave like tech startups as opposed to academic labs or healthcare organizations where sort of middle managers are, are uh, in charge of everything. And I think we as people that work in that IT and data and tech space can sometimes come in and be the little poke that certain agencies need uh, in order to subscribe to a bit more of an innovation agenda. So if you're at the trainee stage in your career, um, um, as frustrating as public health agencies can be, I would encourage you to consider them as a place that you might want to work. The healthcare sector is one of those places where you have a chance to really make a difference, and we as informaticians have the chance to kind of be the change we want to see in those environments and bring a bit more of that tech, bring a bit more of that IT mentality to them. Um, and if you're somebody that is uh, a bit further ahead in their careers, maybe thinking about working with a public health agency, collaborating with um, one of these uh, healthcare uh, entities or institutions, one of the things that I've realized um, that's important about doing innovation or innovative collaborations with them is not just delivering a product, not just saying, okay, we're gonna make you a tool to do something, but kind of delivering the process at the same time, showing them how um, the IT and the software development cycle work, showing them how you can do this sort of agile development where you're constantly getting user feedback. Show them that by collaborating and working together as informatician and as public health person, you can put together really cool products and try to bring a bit of that tech mindset to the way they've traditionally done things. So that's lesson one, try and be innovative. And if you're looking for um, what I think sort of the next big uh, area to tap into is, certainly, you know, 10 years ago it was genomics, um, but these days I think it's definitely um, machine learning. And this is obviously, like genomics, an area where we as bioinformaticians are really primed to help out. So this is just an example of what's happening next week at BCCDC. We started a series of workshops on machine learning in public health. Um, what is it? <clears throat> How can it be used in public health? Everything from introduction to some of the basic algorithms up to things on uh, data and information visualization. Our first talk is February, and we've got somebody uh, who's done a lot of work on using open data for predictive public health analytics at a municipal level, coming to talk about how you can take smart cities data, integrate it together with public health data, uh, and use that to answer questions. So 
we in public health, we're often the stewards of many different data streams, um, but we don't often use them particularly well. We have them, but we're not harnessing them to their full potential, um, and people are just kind of storing them. They're not actually turning any uh, analytical eye to them. They're not using them to develop hypotheses or insights, and I really think if you want to be innovative in public health these days, your best opportunity in bringing a machine learning data science approach to these existing data sets, just getting into them um, and starting to come up with some interesting insights. So getting the data clean, analyzing it, visualizing it, um, that I think really is the future of public health. So if you want a cool job in public health, it leverages your bioinformatics skills. Anything related to machine learning is the ticket to a, a decent salary. So that's where the future is, um, but we'll look back on the past a little bit um, to go through some of the other lessons that I've learned. Um, so when I started in 2009, I come from, my PhD was with Fiona Brinkman, I was her first PhD student, and I worked on uh, developing computational methods to predict bacterial protein subcellular localiza localization, and this was back in the day when uh, the number of microbial sequence microbial genomes, when I started my PhD, there were about 25 of them. Um, when I finished, there were about 250. Um, I certainly looked at TB once when we ran it through our software and that was it. Um, my postdoctoral fellowship was all on uh, the human innate immune system, understanding infection from the host's perspective, and doing some network analysis and visualization. I didn't touch TB at all. So when I started <coughs> at BCCDC and was hired to work on this TB project, uh, I had a lot to learn. Um, so the basic summary of mycobacterium tuberculosis, it's a bacterial pathogen, um, it is still, um, even though people often think of TB as a disease of the past, it is the number one infectious disease killer in the entire world. It comes in two forms of infection. Active TB is the symptomatic infectious one, can transmit from person to person. Um, <clears throat> Latent TB, which as many as about a quarter of the world's population might have, uh, the bug is basically sleeping in your lung. It doesn't transmit from person to person, but it can wake up at some point. For um, every 10 people that have latent TB infection, one of those, the bug will wake up at some point and cause active disease. Um, so you've got your two forms of TB. When it's active, it can be transmitted through the air, through coughing and talking. It's actually surprisingly difficult to catch if you live in a household with somebody who is extremely infectious with TB. Uh, you still only have about a one in three chance of getting the latent form uh, of infection even after many months of living with them. <clears throat> and it's because people kind of exist along a spectrum of infectiousness. Some are very infectious, they're coughing up lots and lots and lots and lots of bacillus, and some, even though they have active TB disease, are basically dead ends for transmission. They don't spread it to anybody else. Um, and TB does exhibit drug-resistant phenotypes, but unlike other bacteria where there can be all sorts of genetic and genomic explanations for that, like overexpressing an efflux pump or an insertion, or plasmid borne resistance, in TB it's really simple. It's just point mutations. If there's a single letter change, at this position, you can infer that there's going to be uh, a resistance phenotype. So um, because it's got a fairly straightforward genome, 4.4 million base pairs, there's no recombination, no horizontal gene transfer, um, really, really straightforward genome to analyze. And because it's such an interesting clinical problem, it really made a great sort of first use case for applying genomics to public health. 10 years ago, nobody had thought about using sequencing routinely in public health. We started to, and this is where we started. The question that we were interested in looking at um, kind of relates to uh, how can genomics help us reduce TB incidence rate. So incidence is just how many cases of this happen a year, and the rates, as you can see, vary worldwide. The darker blue, the higher the incidence. North America, pretty gray. It's very low incidence. But we like to say in the TB community that because of how um, mobile the world's population is and people are constantly going back and forth between countries, moving to new places, if you've got TB anywhere, you will have TB everywhere. So we were interested in looking at, in British Columbia, <coughs> where rates are low, What's really driving that? How can we understand TB epidemiology with genomics? So we measure uh, incidence rate in cases per 100,000 population. This gives us a way to compare across different regions. 
we look at BC's incidence rate, it's been declining over the past uh, couple of decades, but it's always been a bit higher than Canada's. It's currently, um, in terms of incidence rates, translates to about 250 cases a year, uh, which doesn't sound like much, but it, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty complex infection to, to treat and deal with, six to nine months of antibiotics in the best case scenario. And we're also um, not on track to achieve any of the TB elimination goals that the World Health Organization has set. Um, this is an incredibly inaccurate regression. This is just me drawing a line. I didn't actually generate this in R. This is the uh, keynote regression. Um, but as you can see, if you look at the declining incidence rates, this time it's in cases per million population, just so we can get these numbers to be whole down here. Um, we're not going to reach WHO goals, which is for low incidence settings, getting to pre-elimination or elimination rates, 10 cases per million population, one case per million population by 2035. Well, we will still be declining case rates, but we won't get there completely. So we were interested in understanding <clears throat> what's driving TB in British Columbia. And as I said before, you know, TB anywhere is TB everywhere. And there's a lot of high incidence countries that people regularly move to Canada from. And they might move with a latent TB infection that at some point, once they've come to Canada, wakes up and becomes active disease. And so out of our 250 cases in BC every year, about three quarters of those are as a result of that, what we call latent TB reactivation. Those are just singleton cases for the most part. The, the TB kind of wakes up, the person goes, sees their doctor, gets put on treatment, and for the most part, they don't transmit onward. There's occasional transmission, but for the most part, they're sort of dead ends. But that other three, or the other quarter of cases, <coughs> Those are the ones that I'm really interested in. The TB that is happening in BC, it's arising in BC, and it's transmitting from person to person in BC. So airborne transmission, uh, it, like I said, it's hard to catch, but it still happens, and it happens in the most vulnerable uh, segments of our population. People that are on the streets, people that are homeless, people that are underhoused, people that are struggling with addiction issues. Um, and we, we know that much. We know that there are certain risk factors for TB transmission, but we don't know the exact epidemiology of TB in BC. We don't understand um, why it's transmitting from person to person, who's more infectious than others. We don't understand where this is happening and when this is happening. Where are our big clusters of cases? Who's driving transmission? Um, what is it going to be a big peak with a long tail of cases that activate? Is it going to be, you know, once you get a few cases, you're going to be dealing with cases in that community for years to come? There's a lot of unanswered questions about exactly how this disease is moving around British Columbia. And genomics was our idea for answering these questions. So 10 years ago when I started at BCCDC, we kind of um, invented this, this discipline of genomic epidemiology, which is basically just reading entire genome sequences from the isolates taken from a given outbreak to figure out exactly who transmitted to whom. So in TB, that's person-to-person -person transmission. You can do this for any pathogen. You might be looking at an outbreak of foodborne illness and trying to trace back you know, which food uh, item was the source of this particular outbreak? You know, did you get it from eating the mayonnaise at restaurant B, or did you get it from eating an egg at restaurant C? And, you know, where did that, uh, where did that bug get into the food supply in the first place? So that's basically the basic premise of genomic epidemiology. And <clears throat> where it's an improvement over what we used to do in public health is in its resolution. Um, we've always done DNA fingerprint, well always, always in my sort of adult lifespan. We've done DNA fingerprinting to try and identify related isolates. So say BCCDC realizes that, oh, we've had, you know, 50 cases of salmonella diagnosed this week. The next question is, is that an outbreak? Are all those 50 cases related to each other? Do we need to go out and and launch an investigation and figure out where this is coming from? Or is it just a coincidence? Did 50 people in the province happen to get salmonella that week? So with DNA fingerprinting, what we'd do, we'd go in um, and do a very rough, low resolution uh, typing test to see which isolates were related to each other, which are close enough genetically that they might come from a common source, they might truly represent an outbreak. 
But when we were doing those old school DNA fingerprinting techniques, we were only looking at a small fraction of the pathogen's genome, you know, less than 1% uh, in most cases. So it's a bit like looking at a picture that you've taken, you know, 99% of the pixels away from. You get kind of a rough idea of what it is, but it's only when you look at all of the pixels that that picture snaps into a much clearer view. So with genomic epidemiology, reading the entire genome of every uh, pathogen isolate taken from a particular outbreak, instead of just getting a rough idea of are these related to each other or not, we get a very high resolution view of those and we can actually start to infer person-to-person -person transmissions. And I've always kind of explained it using the telephone analogy, the little game where kids are sitting in a line and whisper a sentence from one kid to the next kid to the next kid to the next kid, and the sentence mutates as it spreads down the line and changes. Um, so if you were to do that game with a bunch of kids and then you told them to just sort of shuffle themselves around the room randomly and you asked each child what sentence they heard, um, you could probably figure out what order they were sitting in. It becomes especially clear if you know some information about those kids, like Johnny will always want to sit next to Jimmy and you know Susie will always want to sit next to Sally. That kind of helps you work it out a little bit further. But essentially we're doing the same thing with genome sequencing. We're reading the complete genomes from pathogens we're looking for the mutations that arise over the course of an outbreak, and we're using the presence or absence of those individual mutations in specific isolates to try and figure out the order that the pathogen spread from person to person. It's just the telephone game writ large. So that's what we started doing um, back in 2008, just when they were recruiting me, but before I officially started, we launched the 40 TB Genomes Project. Um, and this was just when next generation sequencing um, was starting to become affordable, and 40 genomes was like a big, luxurious expense. This was like, oh my god, nobody in the world has ever done this before. This would be really crazy. We ended up having to scale it back by 10%. It became the next year the 36 TB Genomes Project um, because uh, the exchange rate between the US and Canadian dollar got really crappy, as it often does. Uh, the reagents got more expensive, and so we couldn't afford to do as many isolates as we originally thought. But still, 36 was more than anybody had done at that point. So it took us a while to analyze this data, because we honestly, like when I was hired, they just gave me 36 TB genomes and some clinical and epidemiological data, and they're like, okay, make something of this. So I had to sort of sit around for a year and figure out, okay, what can we do with this? But worked out that genomic epidemiology method, worked out that sort of telephone game thing. <clears throat> We had a really sweet New England Journal paper out of it, and we started a second outbreak investigation. <clears throat> the first one that we'd done was retrospective. We were going back and looking at an outbreak that had already happened, but it was very complicated. We never really had an answer about what happened there. Um, but in 2011, we started analyzing an outbreak that was happening in real time. So it was kind of the first use of genomics in the middle of a, a TB outbreak to figure things out. Um, we at that point had um, what I think the internet refers to as a face palm moment when your palm goes to your face because you're like, oh shit, that really screwed something up. Um, and what we realized is uh, we hadn't accounted for within host genetic diversity in the notion that for a chronic infection like TB where people might have the latent form of the infection for many years before it activates and they might have an active infection for many months before they're diagnosed and treated, the whole time they're infectious and potentially you know, coughing on people and transmitting this bug to them, a little bit of genetic and genomic diversity is going to accrue within that individual. So if you've got some TB in this part of the lung and you've got some TB in this part of the lung, they might be a mutation or two different. There's one or two base pairs across 4.4 million letters, but that's enough to introduce some complications into your reconstruction. So if I have TB and I've got you know a population of TB in my lung here and here, if I cough and transmit to you on a day when this lesion is open and contributing to bacteria, you might get a copy of the TB genome that has an A at one particular position. But a month later, maybe this population of TB is what's being coughed out, and you might get a C at that position. And then when I'm reconstructing the outbreak later on, it's very difficult for me to tell that you know the person with the A and the person with the C both were infected by the same individual. So it kind of sent us on a bit of an intellectual tour at that point. And that is lesson number two that I will leave you with, is that you always have to be prepared for these weird 
detours and sometimes you'll get completely thrown off your original track sometimes you'll have one of these face palm moments where you're like oh my god we have to do something completely different um, and you have to be okay with it you have to be agile and willing to adapt quickly so we spent a couple years working on a tool called transphilo which combines evolutionary models with mathematical epidemic and compartmental models um, to basically take genomic data from your outbreak, um, from a set of pathogens in your outbreak, and infer the potential person-to-person -person transmission events that could have happened given what we know about the evolutionary rate of that pathogen, given what we know about timing of infection, um, it incorporates or it accounts for within host diversity. It also accounts for unsampled cases in your outbreak as well. Um, so we took this long intellectual detour, which was really interesting. We got some very cool papers out of it. And it also speaks to another kind of sub-lesson, um, which is that we as bioinformaticians, as people focused on genomics, often focus on one very narrow bit of a problem. Um, so in our case, we were focused on the genomics, and we were focused on a bit of the clinical presentation, who might have transmitted to whom. But there were other things that we didn't consider. We didn't consider the evolutionary biology of what might be going on. We didn't consider um, how mathematical modeling of disease transmission might help us with our reconstructions. So so um, whenever you're engaged in an applied research project, it's best to get as many heads around the table as possible because they will point out things like, did you consider this? Did you consider this? If we had started with a team that you know included myself, a sort of genomics and bioinformatics person, included our clinical folks, um, and included somebody uh, who was sort of a phylogenetics evolutionary expert, included somebody who was a math modeler, included the public health officials that were using this data on the front line, we probably wouldn't have had such big a detour or we would have maybe up front recognized that, oh, we should account for this and this and this. So it's always best to build as big a team as possible. It will help you avoid those little accidental detours when you can get as many perspectives around the table. And that I learned like right out of my PhD as well. The more people you get around the table, the better. Recently, um, this is, you don't have to read through this, this is just a figure um, from some work that we did with an ethicist. We expanded the, the scope of our collaboration to include a social scientist who's interested in mapping what are some of the issues around using genomics as a tool to reconstruct disease transmission. What are people thinking about? And so that gives you this other layer of thinking about um, how do we approach this problem that I never would have considered before. So try and get outside the box a little. Work with people on the front lines of healthcare. Work with people in other academic disciplines, whether it's you know it's a statistician, the info biz person, the math modeler, the evolutionary biologist, and work with social scientists too, because they lend an incredibly important perspective to your work. So we solved uh, the first couple of outbreaks. Um, that one that we wrote up in the New England Journal of Medicine was largely due to that particular community's um, proclivity for smoking crack cocaine, which is what is shown in the picture. This is not snow from outside, this is coke. Um, we did the second outbreak. We sequenced it in two batches. This was one um, that we, uh, it was an outbreak centered around a homeless shelter, and this is a little network um, showing individuals, they're the nodes in the network, and the putative transmissions that led to each person's uh, infection. Um, and anybody whose node is contained within a circle were clients of or people that were frequently at a one particular homeless shelter in this area. So we were able to take this map that we generated in real time in the outbreak, um, share it with the folks that were managing this outbreak on the ground, and be able to point out to key individuals whose contacts maybe merited additional follow-up. We actually had kind of a fun paper that came out of that too. That transphilo method that I mentioned not only infers um, potential person-to-person -person transmission events, but it also infers the time window that those uh, transmissions might have happened in as well. And it's always a bit of a challenge declaring a TB outbreak over because some people will get infected, the bug will go latent for many years, and then it'll wake up two, three, four years after they were infected. Um, so it's hard to understand when you've got a new case, 
is this truly new? Did somebody just get transmitted to in the last few months? Or is this just reactivation of a case that was acquired much earlier? But with Transpilo, we can actually start to answer some of those questions and time these transmission events. And we were able to use it to declare this outbreak over. And it was really cool to see one of the health agencies say, look, we use genomics as a tool to declare this outbreak over and done with. So it's it kind of a neat validation. Um, <clears throat> we kept sequencing after that, so we did two outbreaks. We did the Cracker King one, we did the homeless shelter outbreak, and based on having done this twice, we're like, okay, clearly we're qualified to do it for every single TV isolate that we've ever seen in BC. Um, so we just decided to massively scale things up, and in 2012 we launched a provincial study, uh, basically went back through the freezers at BC CDC, pulled out loads and loads of isolates, we DNA fingerprinted a whole bunch of them, 2,300 of them, and the ones that looked like they might potentially be clustered, um, we then followed up with whole genome sequencing. And in total, we sequenced about 1,400 isolates collected between 2005 and 2014, um, which were uh, the clustered isolates as well as some drug-resistant isolates we were interested in looking at. And since then, we've just been doing every uh, TB isolate that came in the door um, from 2015, 2016, and 2017. So that's about another 750 or so isolates. So the third lesson um, comes from sort of this part of the timeline uh, and some of the informatics we were doing which is uh, don't let perfection become the enemy of getting something good out the door in a reasonable time frame. And I think this is um, particularly good advice for trainees and early career investigators in the room. Um, in genomic epidemiology, this sort of manifests as the quest for the perfect variant calling pipeline. Like, how can we get the maximum number of high quality variants that we can use to infer transmission without losing too much information? We don't want to throw good variants out the door. And honestly, you know, if I didn't have this as my mantra, I'd probably still be sitting at my desk benchmarking different pipelines <laughs> against each other, going, I don't know, well, there's a new version of this one coming out. Maybe we should test that one instead. Sometimes you just have to say, like, screw it, this is good enough, and just move on. Um, I think a lot of us often think we need to have something absolutely perfect, like this perfect, polished, beautiful nugget to uh, release into the wild, uh, to put on GitHub, to publish. But honestly, all of us, like PIs, superstar software developers, whatever, we're all just making this up as we go along. Um, and people talk about imposter syndrome a lot. It's totally real, um, and all of us have it. When you start talking about it with your other colleagues, they're like, oh, you super smart person that I always thought was like the smartest genomic epidemiologist in the world, you have no idea what you're doing either. Great. Um, so all of us are just constantly making this up as we go. Um, so don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about, oh my god, this has to be absolutely airtight. Just get something good out the door and get it out the door in a preliminary form. If you're making a pipeline, put it out there on GitHub, write a little preprint about it, stick it up on BioArchive, um, get colleagues to play with it. There's a big microbial bioinformatics Slack uh, community, and people regularly will throw up bits of code. <clears throat> early releases that they've just pushed to GitHub, and they're like, hey, everybody, take a look at this, you know, see if you can break it. You can get a lot of really good feedback from the community. You can put something good out there, share it with your colleagues. That thing will become better as you're working towards the publication process, and uh, you can get a really nice product out there. Um, and I would also say, too, publication-wise, you know, get everything out there in preprint land, but think about other journals, uh, too. My favorite publishing experience out of all the papers we released was actually with PeerJ, um, which is like a really lovely open access journal. It was fast peer review. The reviews were really thoughtful because the reviews are published alongside of the articles, so you get really great feedback. Um, the page charge is really low. You can even subscribe for lifetime memberships. It's really cool. It's just kind of an interesting, nice new model uh, of, uh, of publishing. And this I borrowed from one of my favorite people in bioinformaticians, uh, Taurus, Torsten Seaman. He's at Torsten Seaman on Twitter. Um, but he's a fantastic software developer, but he's not perfect either. I mean, he's got imposter syndrome like the rest of us. Um, this is some advice that he gave. We had a conference, um, ASM Next Gen Sequencing Conference, and this was Torsten's advice. I'm not going to read these all off the page, but this is how you make good software. Um, what makes a good tool? What makes a bad tool? Listen to Torsten. He's fantastic. 
Uh, alongside the transmission stuff that we were doing, we also collaborated with Oxford and Public Health England on some work on using genomics as a tool for uh, diagnosing TB in the clinical reference laboratory. Um, pretty straightforward process. You wait until a TB sample has uh, come up as culture positive on this little system that we use, and once it's being culture positive for a day, you can go in, extract some DNA, sequence it, um, send all that data, the raw data, up to a central uh, analysis server where a pipeline, a good pipeline, a good enough pipeline, uh, is run to do speciation and resistance prediction. Uh, whether clusters with other isolates. Uh, and this particular collaboration leads to the last two lessons that I want to mention. The first is that um, if you look at the Venn diagram overlap or this the SQL like inner join um, between the bioinformatics community and the design community, um, that overlap is basically null. Uh, bioinformaticians are usually terrible at designing things. So if you are making a software pipeline that publishes a report like or a web page at the end, if you're making a tool that has a graphical user interface, get somebody else to design it. Um, design isn't just about making something look nice, but it's about making it work as well. Uh, as a postdoc, I did a lot of collaboration with Tamara Munzner, who's an InfoViz uh, researcher at UBC, and that kind of left me with an appreciation for uh, good design and good visualization. The uh, that sort of diagnostic pipeline that I showed you, sequence from culture, do the central analysis, um, spits out a report at the end. And when we were doing the pilot project, the report was designed by Tim Walker, who is a doctor. This is a report that is going to doctors to interpret. And Tim made, you know, a fairly nice, lovely, calming blue report here. Um, but then when this project scaled up and we started implementing whole genome sequencing routinely in the clinical lab, and the analysis pipeline became the domain of the staff bioinformaticians, suddenly the report got ugly, and then when a new bioinformatician came in, suddenly it got uglier, <laughs> to the point where me, who at this point had probably sequenced more TB genomes than anybody else on the planet, I would be looking at this report going, do I actually know what that means? Um, so we did at uh, BCCDC a design study. This is um, an approach taken from the InfoViz literature to say, how can we build a better whole genome sequencing report? Uh, I'm not going to walk you through this. Um, there's a paper in PeerJ that you can read. But we came up with um, what, in the end, was a much more intuitive, interpretable report that's based on user needs, user workflows, uh, and some basic design principles. So if you are creating any sort of public or user-facing product, get a designer. And the fifth lesson, the last one that I'll leave you with, also came out of this work. Um, this is a somewhat obscure paper that we published uh, early on in some of the InfoViz stuff that we were doing. Um, and it sort of speaks to the fact that we in the academic and research space, we often go into collaborations out there in the wild with um, this sort of this idealized vision of we're going to build an amazing software tool, we're going to build this incredible platform and everybody's going to use it and love it and it's going to be incredible. But what we often fail to do is recognize that there are a lot of constraints out there in the real world that will affect whether that tool is used, whether um, it can be taken up sustainably, whether it will make a difference. Like with that report that I just showed you on the previous slide, one thing we realized early on is that the uh, Public Health England in, uh, information sort of ecosystem required that that report had to be faxable. So it had to be a static piece of paper in black and white that could be faxed. We couldn't have this cutesy interactive dashboard. We had to have something that could just come out of a fax machine and be equally intuitive and interpretable as something more sophisticated. So when you're working with public health, when you're working with public health care, there will be a lot of constraints. Some of them are organizational, um, like just the fact that most of your end users won't even be able to install anything on their laptop or their computer because it's all locked down and handled by some central IT whose office is way off in another suburb and who never answers your calls. Um, sometimes it's regulatory constraints when you're working with healthcare or patient data. There's certain things you can see and can't see. But if you don't stop to think about what these constraints are, 
at the beginning of a bioinformatics development project, you run the risk of making something incredibly cool that can be used by absolutely nobody. So many good projects die on the vine because you're not thinking about implementation right up front. So that's the last lesson. I'll wind up there. There's some more cats. If you can't get through a Jen presentation without some cats, uh, Jen Guthrie and Anna Krasan were the grad students that did all the amazing work on this project. Jay and Tori and Tamara are other collaborators. Uh, and yeah, thanks for having me out on this very snowy and fantastic day. <laughs>